cool. Hey, welcome everybody uh, to the Consequence of Habit virtual meeting. All are welcome here. So our mission at Consequence of Habit is to empower individuals and communities by bringing awareness to the impact habits have on mental health, success, and the environment. Discussion guidelines. So our habits and solutions are as diverse as we are. We respect each other and refrain from giving any unwarranted advice, interrupting each other, talking down from a high ground, or directly commenting on another share. But that does not mean that we can't allow someone's share to resonate with us, to remind us of our own experience. So this is all for the discussion portion. Um, and please let you hear here, let it stay here. People may share some things that are sensitive and they don't want the world to know about. Um, and that we respect that. And of course, you got to be nice. So be kind or be gone. <laughs> Introductions. Oh, we've already kind of run through this. Um, is there anyone that hasn't introduced themselves who would like to? I see there's a, a Dennis is, is here. I, I'm not sure if you introduced yourself. If you'd like to, you can. Sure. Um, it's actually pronounced Denis, the French name. Oh. Oh, Denny, sorry. But uh, no problem. Yeah. Hi. Um, just kind of stumbled across you guys. We've been talking to JT today on LinkedIn. Uh, had a really good friend who passed away a few, few years back who was really dedicated to Wim Hof. And so I'm kind of excited to pursue his legacy and try this out. Awesome. Glad you're here, Denny. No, I'm, I'm my condolences here with your friend, man. Oh, it was a few years back, but he he was a real mentor to me, and uh, he'd always talk about his ice baths. So you know, I'm intrigued. Awesome, cool. Glad you're here. So, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jason. It's all yours, man. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks, JT, for for having me on and the rest of the Consequence of, of Habit team. Um, I'm Jason, and I'm a Wim Hof Method instructor, a level two. I've been been at it for a while now. Um, I guess I got certified about three, four years ago and um, started doing Wim Hof Method workshops, which is uh, a three to four hour event where we tell everybody the the history, the, the details of, of Wim Hof, who he was. Uh, we talk about the method. Uh, we give some science and background on it. Um, then we show you the three pillars of the Wim Hof method, which I'll get into, uh, we dive into them. And we give everybody a good solid breathing session in a group um, and then a, uh, in an ice bath to simulate the cold exposure um, aspect of his method. And the third pillar is the, the mindset, which we also talk about uh, what that is. <clears throat> but a little bit about me, um, like why would I get into ice baths in the first place? It's one of the questions we always ask in a workshop. Like what brings you here to to, to breathe and hyperventilate with a bunch of people and, and hop in a freezing cold ice bath. It's very uncomfortable. There's probably something driving or a curiosity or, or something. And sometimes when we share, we feel connected because we, we so that resonates with us. Um, for me, I always struggled with anxiety and I, I shared this in my, my workshops and I'm pretty open about it because um, I mean, I don't mind if, what people think of me and if there's a way that I could potentially help somebody, I kind of want, I want that out there. Um, I try to solve that anxiety through many different avenues. Uh, the one that I, I kept coming back to um, as a younger adult or in my teens and then twenties was, was drinking and, and alcohol was a way to subdue my anxiety. Um, and that just, <clears throat> it worked um, until, until it didn't, until I, until it, you know, was, was destroying my life, liver. I, I uh, was living on the West Coast at the time. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I was living in San Diego, California, and um, continued to get worse and worse. I'd end up drinking for weeks on end, month or so, and then end up in the detox, an emergency room. They detox me, and uh, and I've done that on the East Coast. I've done it on the West Coast. I've actually done it in Mexico, and I kept thinking this is the last time. I can't end up like this again. Um, and I couldn't find the answers out there. I've been to every anonymous group. I had success in anonymous groups for over five years of continued sobriety and um, counseling and dumped money thinking in, into this, you know, but my last penny thinking, all right, well, I, I better invest in myself and stop in this drinking habit that I have or else I'm not going to have the future to spend any of this money in anyway. And I thought I hit rock bottom so many times until I just moved home um, at just about 30 years old uh, and with my parents on the East Coast. And I started this journey inward of, 
all right, I, everything that I've reached out and searched for, I'm not finding it. Let me just quiet my mind. And I had a yoga practice at the time. And that's what I, that's what I relied on. That's what I fell back on. I found within a, a 60 minute yoga class towards that last five, 10 minutes, I was finding my brain finally slowing down. Those thoughts finally slowing down that I so much associated who I was with those thoughts. And I was able to distance myself from at the end of that class. And I don't think I could put a name on it at the time, but that's what really brought me back over and over again. And I would go to work. I, <clears throat> I worked for the Navy and I still work for them um, full time during the day. And then I would go and I'll take one, two, three hot yoga classes in a, a row until my brain finally slowed down. And I go home and go to sleep. And it started to bring mindfulness and it started to bring space um, that I liked. So I enrolled in a 200 hour training program um, with my anxiety. I never thought that I would talk in front of people. I didn't think that was anything on my radar that I wanted. I just wanted to learn more about this thing that was giving me this sense of peace and by the time I got done, I had just enough confidence to get up there and teach. And what I found in a 60-minute yoga class of that quieting the mind, I was able to find when I, when I got in front of people and started teaching, I shut off my mind and I was there to give it away. <clears throat> so an aspect that I always learned is you learn something and then you give it away. That's been very prominent in my life. And, and, and that's what I'm doing here. Um, from there, I ended up doing a, a couple more yoga trainings. I did the Wim Hof training led to a fire walking training, another thing that we provide in our, our retreats uh, that we run, um, and then a, a kundalini yoga training. And I, I just, I continue to learn, then turn around and give it away in some sort of a venue, whether that's a day workshop, weekend, or a week retreat. Um, most recently, me and my business partner are starting a, a studio so we can offer this on a weekly consistent basis for at least a community around here. Um, and for me, it's, uh, it's changed my life. The Wim Hof method, what took me 60 minutes to find the yoga class, I was finding within, you know, two rounds of the breath work, which will take you about five, 10 minutes, where I was finding within 30 seconds of getting in an ice bath, I had to let those thoughts go and focus on my breath or else it was going to be a very uncomfortable time in that ice bath. And the powerfulness of the method um, was what grabbed my attention. And, and I, honestly started to change me to, to the point that now I, I don't, th I don't think about drinking. That seems like it was somebody else. Um, I actively work on this stuff, uh, trying to better myself, bringing in new stuff. And I just find the old stuff that's not serving me falls away, which was a, a different mentality than I focused on in the past. I used to be so focused on not doing something. And now I'm focused on doing something, letting the things that don't serve me kind of fall away. So that's what brought me to the Wim Hof method. And out of all those things I listed that I got into in my trainings, although I love the, the, the walking across hot coals as a fire walk, nothing makes you feel better than doing the Wim Hof method. Uh, the breathing and the cold exposure has been, been life-changing for me. Um, so that's what's kind of led me to this. Um, and where I'm at now, I mean, I haven't had a drink in years. I used to count every day. And now I'd have to go back to a calendar to tell you exactly how long it's been even how many years. And uh, we give this away on a, on a weekly basis. Um, this coming weekend, we're holding three, uh, four hour workshops uh, between Saturday and Sunday. And uh, from those workshops, we end up meeting people that want to expose it to another community and then we book more. And, and that's how we've been getting the word out with this. Um, and we come across other people that see us on Instagram or the Wim Hof Method site uh, when they Google it um, and reach out either on Instagram or to our email or drop a message on our website. And, uh, you know, that's how, that's how Consequence of Habit found me. And we're going to be doing a workshop, uh, you know, in, uh, I believe it's all, uh, October 1st um, here in New Jersey um, or in the New Jersey area, just across the bridge from where I'm at. And, uh, and it's cool, these connections that we get to make. And, I want to tell you a little bit about the Wim Hof method tonight. I'm going to go through the three pillars that make up the Wim Hof method. It's a very simple method. Um, I'm going to dive into them a little bit. I want to show you guys the breath work and give you a chance to at least do one or two rounds on your own while you're, while you're there at home um, to see what it feels like. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the cold exposure and the mindset pillars. Um, and you might not have an ice bath or I think... Uh, <laughs> You're mentioned, you're mentioned in there, Daniel, about getting a chest freezer, um, which I had. Let me 
let me take it around right here. You see my my chest freezer here that I I dunk into on a daily basis to simulate cold exposure. But you can do it with a cold shower. If you're in a colder environment, you can do it um, outside uh, and just and just sit there in the cold and use that stressor as a form of meditation. Um, but look to get into each of these topics and then um, tell you how to develop a personal practice and open up the, the discussion then and we can, we can go back and forth. And if anything resonates with you, you have other questions, um, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a way for us to provide, um, you know, my website uh, for the events that we have coming up. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of stuff this summer and we have two retreats booked for later this year. Um, but just different options. There's also other, you can go on the Wim Hof Method site and just see what's in your area. You're not in the, in the United States. Um, you know, you can see who's the closest holding one of these events uh, and, and reach out and, and do one with them as well. Uh, all the instructors are great. I've, I've had a chance to meet a lot of them, including Wim Hof. And, um, you know, everybody's of that same mentality. It's one of the best things about doing these workshops is you get a lot of like-minded people in the sense that they're looking to better themselves, even if they don't know it. Just that curiosity to bring you here, you're looking for something. Um, and, uh, and it's fun to be in a community where we're all looking for something together and we're finding it and sharing that experience. I'm gonna flip to the next slide, I can, I can jump into it. So the three pillars that I touched on were keeping it simple, breath work, cold exposure, and mindset. Um, the breathwork pillar, and I think maybe on the next slide, I'd put a little bit more detail into, uh, into what, what goes into the breathwork. Um, and maybe before I do that, I'll give you a little background on Wim Hof. I don't know if everybody knows him. You've probably seen him lately on, or you may have seen him on uh, the different TV shows, or he has, uh, I know he did some, he's done a couple of documentaries. I think he actually has a movie that's coming out soon. I just finished his BBC special, Freeze the Fear, where he took some celebrities through his method and these challenges and overcoming fear. Um, I just like watching them and watching how different people apply this method differently. Um, but he, he got his start, his big, there's always a, a, there's a turning point, right? That makes you search for something, whether it's just a feeling of mundaneness and I want to change this or something happens that you can put your finger on and it's an event and you say, and, and, and after that, everything changes and you're looking for something to help you get control again in your life. For Wim Hof, he was always into the, the outdoors, into yoga. He traveled around India, learning different breathing techniques. One of the breathing techniques, which is interesting, is uh, to, uh, this uh, breathing that Tibetan monks came up with. It's called Tomo breathing. And the Tibetan monks for thousands of years would prove that they mastered this breathing technique by sitting outside in sub-zero conditions. And they'd place wet rags onto their back. And they'd see how many of those wet rags they could warm and dry to see how well they've mastered this technique. We tell that story because Wim Hof always says, I'm not the one that came up with this stuff. This has been around forever. It's accessible to everybody. I'm just the first one to bring it to science. And he did. His pivotal point here was when uh, he had four children, wife that he loved dearly, and his wife uh, ended up committing suicide and jumped from their eight-story building after kissing their kids goodbye. And Wim Hof was devastated. He didn't realize it, but she'd been suffering the last couple of years of their marriage from uh, depression, anxiety, and not knowing much about it, uh, you know, 40 years ago, he didn't know what to do. And after her passing, he really didn't know what to do. He didn't know how he was going to take care of these four kids. And he didn't know how he was going to get over the sadness of losing his wife. So he fell back on some tools that he had in his tool belt, this deep breathing. He found that through the deep breathing, and focusing on his breath, the thoughts would slowly slow and he'd get connection with his body. Um, and he said it was around that time he was walking by a cold lake, lived in the Netherlands, and he it called to him. And he said he walked in, submerged himself completely, and all the thoughts left and he just focused on his breath. He said the cold was his teacher and taught him to focus on his breathing because that's where his awareness went to. You lose your breath when you get in that cold water and you have to force those <sighs> nice controlled long breaths and he found control there in the cold water and he found peace and he kept going back to these things that 
brought him this peace and brought him this this strength. And uh, he found that he had way more uh, strength and control over his body than he ever thought that he did. Um, he he wanted to show people and he wanted to share this with them. He would do feats where he'd break two holes in the ice and swim underneath an icy it, the ice in an icy lake. Um, he was doing that one day for uh, a local news crew and somebody fell in the ice on the other side of the lake. He went and saved them. He kind of became a local hero, building him further notoriety. And from there, he kept doing crazier and crazier uh, uh, different events. Um, he held 26 world records at one point. One of them was sitting in ice the longest. Uh, he ran a, a marathon in the desert without water. He's not a runner. He ran a half marathon uh, above the Arctic Circle barefoot. Um, the one that, as a hiker, the one that gets me the most is he hiked up to the top of Everest, or at least the kill zone, to about 27,000 feet uh, with a pair of boots and just shorts on. Um, there's there's pictures of him. You can Google it after this. And and he got caught in a whiteout when he was up there. Most people stop at different base camps. He used his breathing technique and mindset to keep his cool, keep fear at bay, and continue onward. Um, and he said when he got caught in that whiteout, that's what he did. He said he didn't panic. He focused on his breath, was able to gain control, and then continue on. Um, I find that you know, I find that interesting. In my 20s, I probably wasn't as good as shape. And I, I got altitude sickness at 11,000 feet. So <laughs> I think of that, and I'm pretty amazed by it. <clears throat> but he kept doing these things. And, and every time he'd say, hey, everybody can do this. This isn't just me. I want to prove that I'm able to tap into my autonomic nervous system, which previously the medical community thought was completely impossible. You can't regulate your temperature. You can't regulate your immune system. Those functions happen independently from your thoughts and, and, and your control. Um, and Wim kept saying, you can, you can. And it wasn't until he continued to build more notoriety that he got attention to Radbound University. And they did this study on him, which was a real pivotal point in uh, Wim, Hof's, Wim Hof's effort to, to change the world, he always says, to, to get this message out there. And what they did in the study, it was called the endotoxin study. You may or may not have heard about it. But what they did was they they uh, planned out a predictable innate immune response by giving hundreds of people uh, this, this endotoxin, and it was a dead E. coli bacteria. And when injected with endotoxin, your body thinks that it's a real uh, E. coli bacteria for about three to four hours until it figures out that it's not. So it reacts as if you actually have E. coli. You get uh, very high fevers, you get violently ill, um, stomach-wise, throwing up, the chills, headaches, all that for about three to four hours. And they planned this out with a bunch of people that you know, signed up for these experiments. And they said, all right, when this is what happens to your, your immune system. Um, let's see if you have any effect over your, uh, your immune response. <clears throat> so they injected him with the, the endotoxin. He did his breathing meditation and he had nothing. Didn't get sick, no effects from this endotoxin. And they said, well, maybe you're just that 1% or 0.001% that we haven't tested yet. You're able to hike up to the top of Everest. You're able to sit in ice water for two hours, all this stuff. So they conducted an experiment and they, uh, they conducted the experiment. They gave him a group of 18 people and they said, you train these 18 people um, and then bring them back in two weeks. And if you ever seen anything with Wim Hof or, or heard him talk, He's not much for waiting. He brings them back in five days and says, these guys are ready. Let's do it. They pick 12 of his 18 and they pick a control group of 12 from the university that didn't know any of this meditation. Um, the way that they got them to do it is they said, all right, we'll do it and we'll get sick. But you tell us how uh, you teach us the method after we do this experiment. So they got that group. That group did get violently ill. Uh, they were all very sick for about three to four hours. Wim Hof's random grouping of 12 with only five days of uh, instruction had little to no symptoms and they were amazed. And then they did this study two years later with the same exact results. Um, they did some tests on his blood showing that he did actively uh, release more um, anti-inflammatory proteins, one of which is interleukin-10 that's responsible for decreasing the inflammation in your body. Um, and, and he actively affected his uh, autonomic nervous system, his immune system, which is part of that.
So this was a big one um, for him. This was the recognition from the medical community that he was looking for for so long. And from there, his, his kids, his four kids that he ended up raising were helped him put together this company called Inner Fire. And they took what he was doing and they're like, all right, you keep saying that, that everybody can do this. What is it? Let's box it up. Let's put it in a method. And they helped him develop these three pillars of breath work, cold exposure and mindset and helped him develop a platform where he can get this out and train instructors like myself that are able to come out here and share it with more people. So it's pretty cool to see his vision come to fruition, you know, over four or five decades um, of doing this. So I always like to think about that when I think I'm not where I should be. And I'm like, well, Wim had to think that for 30, 40 years and people laughing at him thinking that he was, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, a circus act. And uh, I think he's still labeled as a daredevil on some sites, you know, um, but, you know, he's, he's gotten that recognition that, that he was looking for. So what is it? Let's get into it. What can you take away today? The breathwork piece. So there's three parts of the breathwork. There's a hyperventilation that gets you deep into your sympathetic nervous system. There's a retention that gets you into your parasympathetic nervous system. And then there's a recovery breath where you take a deep inhale in and you squeeze all the energy or blood, that oxygen rich blood that you just breathe in, you squeeze everything up to the crown of your head. Or if you want to think of your body as a tube of toothpaste, squeezing your legs first, your glutes, your belly, your chest up to your head and you hold it there. Um, sometimes we release the tension in our lower part of our body and then we re-squeeze and bring it back up like you would with a toothpaste. Um, so accessing both sides of our, our nervous system, um, is really important. Most of the time today in today's day and age, we're always slightly in the sympathetic, uh, back when cavemen were around, you're running around outside, living in nature, you would leave the cave, you would go hunt, you get chased by a tiger, sympathetic nervous system, you, you ramp all the way up and then you come back to the cave at night and you go deep in your parasympathetic, the rest, the recovery, um, that side of your nervous system. Today, we have phones, we have emails, we have obligation, we have this frontal lobe that's maybe overdeveloped, which is constantly tossing out new ideas. There's always something going on up there. Um, we're always looking at our phone. We're always staying slightly in the sympathetic nervous system. And we're not allowing ourselves to really relax and we're not allowing ourselves to really ramp up all the way into the extent of our nervous system. Um, so this, this method starts to get us back in touch with our bodies and back in touch with the natural way that we're supposed to be. So taking our body deep into the sympathetic, deep into the parasympathetic, and it'll even us out right in the middle instead of always being a little sympathetic. Because if you're always a little bit in the sympathetic, that's going to be lead to irritation. It's going to lead to inflammation. And if you look at every disease out there, it's all inflammation in the body, you know, inflammation in the brain, depression, um, you know, men mental illnesses, inflammation in the gut, Crohn's disease, these different things, you know, Parkinson's. I mean, you can go on and on and, and, and a lot of them, they come back to inflammation in your body. So, how do we reduce that inflammation? Let's ramp our body all the way up and then let's calm it all the way down. Um, so with the first part of the breath work, there's a hyperventilation and Wim Hof's instruction is 30 deep inhales in, you let it go. And what that looks like is use your mouth, nose. <clears throat> Out of all the breathing techniques out there, I, I found this to be one of the easiest ones. You just take a big inhale in, you fill all the way up from your belly to your chest he cues belly, chest, head. You obviously can't breathe into the top of your head, but imagining it going all the way up, you can almost feel the energy go to the top of your head. Take a big inhale in. Use your mouth, nose, everything. Let it go. So you take about 30 of those breaths. When we're in a workshop, I'm even a little lightheaded just from doing that. That's, that's one of those, that's, that's one of the effects. You get lightheaded, the physical effects, lightheaded, uh, maybe a little tingling in your body, you feel light, um, your ears might ring. You're, the tingliness comes from higher oxygen than CO2 ratio 
which makes the nerves a little bit more sensitive. So know that that's okay. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. You take 30 or so breaths. We generally cue more in a workshop to ramp you even further into your sympathetic nervous system because we know that if you do, you'll go deeper into your parasympathetic, that nice relaxed feeling on the other side. So after those 30 or so deep hyperventilating breaths, we'll count you down and then you'll enter into your retention. So it'll look like five, four, big inhales in, three, two, one, we cue big inhale in, out. And then the retention is, you just release to even lungs. You don't, you don't exhale too much. So you'd be holding tension there. You don't hold any air in because then you're holding tension. No tension. So it'd be even lungs. Like if you just let the air out of the balloon and there's still a little bit of air in the balloon, but it's, it's at equilibrium with the environment on the outside. So that's the retention. You're not holding it in. You're not holding it out. Nice and even. And you just seal your lips and hold. And you'll be able to hold, we usually recommend a minute to a minute and 15 seconds, that first breath hold. Um, we have uh, four breathing videos posted on our website. You could just put it in YouTube, go along with Wim Hof's guided breathings. Um, there's plenty that are out there. And um, all the retentions are different, but usually starting around a minute, minute and 15 seconds. And your breath hold will end up going up to two minutes, no problem, three minutes, no problem, um, without any air in your lungs. And the reason for this is because when you're hyperventilating, your oxygen levels are always going to stay the same. You can have a little oxygen altimeter on your finger. I bought one on, Am on Amazon for, for $10. Um, oxygen is always going to stay the same. CO2 is what you release. That's why I encourage mouth breathing when we do this using your mouth and nose. He says every hole available, just let that air out because what's releasing is that CO2. And as you release that CO2, that CO oxygen stays up here, CO2 begins to decrease, decrease, decrease. And believe it or not, it's CO2 that tells you that you need to take a breath or not take a breath. Oxygen, your body has no idea how much it has. I thought that interesting when I first got into this method. So you breathe out all the CO2 and you create a space where now your body doesn't think it needs to take a breath for a long period of time until that CO2 builds back up. And ramping yourself up in the, those hyperventilations that releases adrenaline. And then that oxygen to CO2 difference, that brings your blood into a more alkaline state. But your body, which is good, it's alkaline, more of an alkaline state is bad for viruses and bacteria but your body doesn't want to be too alkaline or too acidic. So as it notices your body going too alkaline, it fires on that reptilian part of your brain and says, we're in danger. Let's fix this. Releases more adrenaline, <clears throat> anti-inflammatory proteins, white blood cells uh, to counteract this effect. And they did tests on Wim Hof and he released more adrenaline in this relaxed state, breathing, and somebody bungee jumping for the first time. And the doctors, I watched the, the, the one documentary, they said bungee jumping for the first time is the most adrenaline releasing thing that we can find somebody to do, that we can, <clears throat> that we can test on somebody. And Wim Hof was exceeding it with this. And uh, <clears throat> so your CO2 oxygen levels are, there's a big disparity between the two when you get done that hyperventilating breathing. And then we enter into the parasympathetic. One, we have created all this time for that CO2 to build back up to the point that your body goes, wait, the CO2 levels are getting a little bit too high. You need to take a breath to bring them back down again. And that CO2 level will, will change. So as we, as we give ourselves that time for it to build up, build up, our bodies continue to relax. On every inhale, your heart rate speeds up. Every exhale, your heart rate slows down. So the longer you're able to hold your breath without taking another inhale in, your heart rate slowing down. As the CO2 builds up, it's a dilator. So it dilates all the blood vessels in your body. And you have 60,000 miles of blood vessels that run through your body and wrap around the world two and a half times. It brings nutrients to every nook and cranny, every cell of your body. And you're dilating all of them. And as that CO2 builds back up, it marries up with that already present oxygen that's in your body and pulls into those new relaxed spaces. 
our body on a daily basis, subconsciously, we hold tension. Stuff comes up. We don't deal with it. We say, we're going to deal with that later. I got to get to work. I got to take care of these kids. And we push it down. Or our subconscious still knows that that's an issue, whatever it is. It could be big trauma. It could be little trauma. It could just be daily tasks that we have to do that we just keep in our subconscious. And, and that manifests in stress in our low twitch muscles, um, back, shoulders, glutes, um, neck, all these places that we might have chronic pain. This is a good opportunity for us to finally relax them with this long retention and allow oxygen to absorb in there. We always get people that say, oh, I, I'd broken my arm or leg or hip and, you know, years ago. And when I did the breathing, I felt a strong sensation in that area. And, and they're all surprised and we always laugh because we, we've heard this so many times. It's, it's that energy that you created in your body. You're finally relaxed and that's going there to heal that part of your body. They did studies on people doing this breathing and somebody that broke a bone was able to heal it in half the amount of time um, that it would normally take just by doing this breathing routine on a daily basis and bringing extra energy and blood flow uh, to that part that needed healing. So a little bit about the, the retention. A lot of good things are happening. Plus it feels great. You're gonna to get to a point where that CO2 builds back up to the point that you need to take a breath. We give those timed guidelines just as a guideline to be able to cue people through the breathing exercise. When you're at home doing it yourself, even if you're listening to a recording and you hear the person say, take your recovery breath, big inhale in, and you don't feel that CO2 building up to that point yet where your body's screaming for a breath, if you ever swam laps underneath a pool and you're like, one more lap, that feeling of, I need to take a breath in, play with that a little bit. This is where the mindset comes in. Just be the watcher. Can you just watch that feeling like it's happening to somebody else, not happening to you? And begin to create that space between you and your thoughts. That's a good practice ground for you to, to try on that, um, to try on that philosophy. But when you can't take it anymore, you take that recovery breath. And that's a big inhale in, hold it with full lungs and squeeze the blood all the way from your legs, glutes, belly. You're squeezing it into your pineal gland, or you can think the crown of your head. Um, ideally, you would focus right in between your eyes and just continue to squeeze that blood upwards. Uh, what you're doing here, um, you know, spiritually, they say, you know, releasing some uh, chemicals from the pineal gland, and you might have some sort of a spiritual experience. Uh, scientifically, what you're doing is your blood vessels are very dilated in your brain, and you're squeezing just this new oxygen-rich blood up to your brain and giving your brain this, this nice bath of oxygenated blood, which most of the time throughout the day, we're just using our frontal lobes the majority of the time. And if you stimulate something, like if I were to stimulate my arm right here, it's going to start turning red. The blood flow is going to go there. So we use our frontal lobes all the time. That's where the blood flow is going. And this recovery breath is a good opportunity to get healthy blood flow to other parts of your brain as well, while your blood vessels are dilated and you have that oxygen rich blood. So <clears throat> how do you do this? So all that time, that was uh, about 30 big inhales in, that's a minute or so on the hyperventilation. You're holding the breath another minute to two minutes. They're at around three minutes, recovery breath, three to four minutes around. And Wim says three rounds will have the effect that you're looking for. So if you're looking for, well, what's the, what's the right dose? Uh, three rounds is a good minimum. When we do our workshops, I'll give it away. We usually don't tell people how many rounds we're doing, but it's usually around eight rounds. So people really have a deep experience. It's like you're going you know, down a set of stairs and you keep going deeper and deeper within yourself on each round. And you, on, on the flip side, say you're in between meetings at work, one round will feel good. We'll, we'll do one together. Um, but even just one round, sometimes I, I can't get my head on straight. I'm thinking about too much stuff. And I don't always do this. Sometimes I sit with my thoughts and, and torture myself. But every once in a while, I'll, I'll lay down and I'll do a round and I clear my head. I create a little bit of space between me and those thoughts. And it gives me a little bit more space to make the right decisions. 
find a calm uh, space to go into my next meeting then. So they say to also do it on an empty stomach. Uh, if you want to do it, it, the morning's a great time to do it. It's a great way to wake up. It's a great way to open up your lungs. I heard this other guy, um, not related to the Wim Hof method, just talking about how taking 30 big breaths in the morning and the night, he's not talking about retention or anything. He's just saying that'll increase your lung capacity and it's good for you. So morning's a great time to do it, empty stomach. But if the only time that you have to do it is after a big meal, you can do it then too. I do it after dinner. I've done it before on a, you know, a day or two fast. I've, uh, <clears throat> I've had the experience and both are good. I'm just telling you what's, what's recommended for your, your own practice to take that into consideration. Um, I guess I'd usually pause around here at the breath work portion um, before, before going any further. Does, do, do we have time for any, any questions or just want me to keep plugging away? Yeah, we, we got time. So if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and uh, ask away. Hey, yeah, Jason, Dan here. Um, quick question. I have a couple of friends in the military who've gone to combat dive school and they swear by the Wim Hof method, which is one of the big reasons why I wanted to hop on this one. However, both of them um, have pushed themselves to that limit to where like one of them has passed out from it. The other one's gotten close. So how do you kind of regulate as you're getting deeper into maybe you're like five, six rounds in? and you start to like kind of push that limit a little bit, what's kind of the safe buffer of, this is the point of no return, I'm gonna black out like MMA style or I'm good, let's do another round. Yeah, no, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for bringing that up. One, always do this laying down. One, the, the, it just feels better laying down, you're relaxed, so it doesn't matter if you pass out. You can do it sitting up, but then you're at risk to hit your head on something that's around you. Um, but if you have a bunch of pillows and there's no desks or chairs or anything, then you're fine. Um, and definitely not around water or driving, you know, because you can pass out. The one thing that we stress is you can pass out when you're doing this. And, and your question is more how to keep yourself from passing out. My answer to that would be you can always decrease how deeply and quickly you're breathing in that hyperventilation. But my recommendation to you would be push it even further and pass out. And then you're going to say, where the hell did I go? I hear him talking. I, I don't, I didn't remember what he said before. <laughs> and then you just get right back into your hyperventilation and right back into the next round. Um, it's good to find your limit and there's nothing wrong with browning out or, or, or passing out during the method as long as you're laying down. Um, so very common. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I've definitely, uh, not tapped out in some jujitsu before when I should have been there. So definitely I'll just lay down when I do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jujitsu is a little bit different. I've definitely gotten choked out doing that myself. Um, and uh, yeah, there you have somebody that's keeping the blood flow from your head here. When you pass out, your body automatically takes another breath and you nice and gently come back. You generally don't even realize that you did pass out um, because you do go to other places in your head that you don't feel like you're here anymore. Um, so that feeling of, of passing out is kind of similar to that sometimes. So you might not even know that you did, but I would say nothing to worry about. Just lay down and, and I would always encourage people to push it as much as they're willing to push it. You feel that tingliness in your hands. It's called tetany from the oxygen to CO2 ratio, oxygen being higher. It can lead to cramping up. We call it T-Rex hands in the Wim Hof community, where you see your hands cramp up like this from too much sensitivity. We even see people, their arms cramp up too, and they get scared. And we just talk them through it and tell them to keep going. And I'm telling you, I've watched a 12-year-old cramp up and he still is. <laughs> and I'm like, hell yeah, man, keep going. Like, don't be scared of that, that feeling. Um, but if you are, that's fine too. Everybody's at different stages and you have different, you have a different way of getting there, you know? Um, if you want to take it slow, take it slow. If you want to go for it, it's, that's what I'd recommend. And uh, there's no harm in it. Awesome. Appreciate it, Jason. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I would say one thing that, that um, surprised me is it's a pretty powerful experience. Like I, I've had one time where I was doing it with um, an instructor and, and I started to black out, but 
but it, it man, it is uh, something I can't describe unless you've actually gone through it, man. It was actually almost like a bit emotional. Like it's, it's really, it brought up some really strange things. And I remember walking upstairs and I'm like, holy crap, man, I don't even know what just hit me. But it, I mean, but, but it was a sense of relaxation that was, it was amazing. Yeah, you, f- you feel amazing after this. Um, really helps reduce anxiety. Um, the uh, lot, lot of health benefits there with your immune system um, and just mentally gaining more control. Um, there's been a lot of success. Uh, you go on and look at some of the studies. You go on the Wim Hof site. Um, he has a bunch of little blurbs on and videos, little five-minute clips on what's actually happening in your body. Um, and some success stories with different diseases. Everything from psoriasis uh, to Parkinson's to rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, The most recent one that I just got this week from the Wim Hof community was the success that they're having with these two young kids that have brain cancer and there's nothing they can do for them. Mom found Wim Hof. He's taking them through the breathing and they're now watching the brain cancer reduce completely um, in both of these children. So gaining control over your body, your mind, it could have a lot of repercussions. I, I don't like this, you know, I like to say these studies because, hey, this is something that's out there. They just haven't proven it completely yet. They know a little bit more about what's going on chemically in your body. Um, but to say this can this cures cancer, you know, it's, it, it's something that it has done. Um, but yeah, not a, not a cure-all. I don't want to promise anything, you know. But I'm trying to think of the best way. Does anybody have any questions about the breath work? We'll, we'll come back to it. I think maybe ending with a breathing session before the discussion might be good. And I just go through the rest of the method. The, the breath work is kind of where uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the information is. But anything before I pivot from, from breath work? All right, great. All right, so... So cold exposure, it's a little more simple. Get your body cold and we're getting into that mindset. If you didn't derive it from the, the breathwork discussion, the, the mindset here is just becoming the watcher and keeping your intention, right? So you're going to go into the cold. Your intention is that you're going to go in and you want to watch that feeling happen to your body and remain in control. So not getting tied to it, lost in all the thoughts that are going on in your head but remaining in control. So there's different ways you can do it. You can do cold meditation outside. I've sat on a frozen lake in my bathing suit in Iceland when it was below zero, 20 mile an hour winds for 20 minutes, meditated. And, you know, your mind saying, get out of the cold, get out of the cold, get out of the cold, get out of the cold. Where's the warm, you know, where's the warm room? And that's the voice that I have to distance myself from and come back to my breath and just stay controlled. And from sitting on that lake, I got up and then went into the icy water for five more minutes after that, and then got out and did horse stance on the freezing lake before finally getting my clothes, putting them back on, and we took the hike back to to civilization. Um, So a lot of different forms there. Uh, Cold shower is easiest to get in. If you want to start, go ahead and take a hot shower, and then step out, turn it all the way cold, find your breath, And then step in and keep a nice, strong breath. The breath is not the same as the breath work portion. And the cold exposure, it's the cold is going to ramp you into your sympathetic nervous system automatically. What you have to do is bring yourself back into your parasympathetic nervous system. You don't need to hyperventilate to get there. The cold is going to hyperventilate for you. So all you have to do, you get in that cold water, you have to... And what we do is we have a big ice bath, 100 gallon cow troughs that we use, and we fill them up with a few hundred pounds of ice water. And we get people in there, down up to your neck, hands go on your knees, and people get in and they're fine. And then that cold hits them and they get into that panic state. Me and my partner would lock eyes with them and breathe nice and slowly. And eventually their breathing comes into cadence with ours. And it usually takes anywhere from a minute to a minute and a half before you feel like, oh, I can stay in here for five, 10 minutes. I I feel in control. And anybody that gets that minute and a half, two minute point that we recommend two minutes of cold exposure, 
you will have gotten in control of your body, of your breath, of your mind. Um, if you want to stay in five minutes, that's great. It's up to you to push it longer than that, but the full physical benefits are released by that two, three minute mark. So we recommend two to five minute ice baths, depending on what you're going for. Me, I do it on a daily or more than daily basis for my mental stability and you feel great afterwards. I mean, you release so many endorphins, um, metabolism goes up 300%. You're activate, activating your brown adipose tissue that's in your shoulders, chest area um, in your body, which burns white fat to produce heat. Um, a lot of really good physical effects from being in there, release of white blood cells. All these effects last, that immune burst lasts for about six days. So we recommend once a week for cold exposure, you know, of, 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 of an ice bath. Um, cold showers, you can do every day. Um, that doesn't mean once a week is all you're allowed to do it. I took, not to sound like a maniac, but I took three ice baths yesterday, each two minutes. Um, one in the morning, one after a workout. And I did a sauna session later and hopped in halfway through, but there's no harm in doing more, uh, more cold exposure, but find a good time that it works in your day. I love doing it in the morning. It clears my head and energizes me for the rest of the day. Complete game changer. Um, so once again, what you would do there is nice, slow breathing. If you're going into the cold shower, turn it cold, get in, feel that shock. And see if you can just notice the shock on your body. If you get in an ice bath, you notice the shock in your body. You have your attention set that you're going to stay in. And you try and slow your breath down as long as you can. A key here, if you're writing things down or jotting them down, I love to hum. That's a great technique to slow your breathing down. You can try it just on your own. Time yourself for a minute. Just hit the timer. See how many breaths you take in a minute. I'm going to give it away. It's going to be around... 13 to 20 breaths, maybe depend on how anxious you are. And then try it again while you hum. That rate of how many breaths you take in a minute will drop to around three to five, which will drastically slow down your heart rate, put you in deeper into your parasympathetic and more in control of your thoughts, of your brains, of your emotions. Um, so after you're done your time in there, you're going to get into a horse stance. This is what Wim Hof uses to warm up. You may have seen people doing it. Let me see if I can demonstrate it here <clears throat> for you to see. It's pretty easy. You would just get into a deep squat into your legs. So your big powerhouse muscles are fired on. Your glutes, your, your quads, your hamstrings. And they did a study on Wim Hof when he was in a, a, wet, uh, a big wetsuit. And they hooked him up to all sorts of nodes. And they found that the way he was able to release heat uh, through his meditation, it was, it was coming from his intercostal muscles. So he developed this stance before he ever had that study done. So he intuitively knew to start pushing that nice warm blood back into his extremities. So he'll move side to side, keeping these legs fired on. It begins to move and mix the relatively cold blood with the warmer blood in your body. I'm telling you, after I take one of these ice baths, I'll stand here and set another timer for one or two minutes. And I feel myself warm up around that one minute mark. I feel that warm blood come back in my hands, legs, feet. And you just do this. You can also use this as a meditation. Wim Hof, there's videos of him standing outside for three hours in sub-zero conditions in a bathing suit, <clears throat> going like this. Finding a meditative space and doing something repeatedly. He also adds in a chant. He'll go, ooh. Ha, ah, ooh, ha. Ah. That vibration creates heat and it keeps your attention and focus. Uh, I remember my first advanced training that I did. There was about 70 of us in a circle doing the horse stance. And I thought, ah, shit, well, I joined another cult. Here we go again. You know, <laughs> I'm like, what are these crazy people doing? And now I'm doing it in backyards. I have neighbors looking at me. Ooh, ha, ah, ooh. I don't think twice about it. Um, but uh, that's, that's the cold exposure. It's simple. Get your body cold. If you stress it out, a stressor of any sort is going to grab your attention. Uh, cultures throughout time have used different stressors. Uh, cold ex the cold exposure just happens to be great for your physical body. Well, there's other cultures that still do some of these meditative techniques today, like Eskimos sitting in a, uh, a cold igloo and beating on 
drums for hours on end until they get to this high meditative state. Uh, there's this one, um, I believe it was a, was a tribe, um, an Indian tribe that would put hooks in their back, tie those hooks to a rope and tie that rope to a pole. And then they'd walk away from the pole so that those hooks would pull against their skin, create a really strong sensation. And they'd have to focus on their breathing to distance their mind from that sensation, taking them to a meditative state. We're doing that here with the cold. Um, so any questions about cold exposure? I mean, tomorrow you can start doing, I mean, you can start doing cold showers immediately. Uh, Wim recommends 15 seconds to start and work your way up to two minutes. An ice bath, I mean, you go get, you know, uh, 60 to 120 pounds of ice and put it in the bathtub or a cow trough. Uh, we get them from Tractor Supply Company. You can buy, you can buy little, little things on Amazon um, that blow up that you can dump ice and water into. I've seen people use trash cans, but a lot of different ways to simulate that cold exposure. Any questions on that before, before moving on? And the mindset portion, which was the next pillar, is it plays into both of these, the cold and the breathing. The, you, have your, you have your intention set, you get in, you become the watcher, you watch the feelings that are going on in your body and just focus on your breathing. That's the mindset there in the cold. And the breathing, your mind's going to start talking to you too around that 10, 20 breath mark, it's going to say, why are you breathing so much? You have plenty of air. And you just watch that thought come and go like you're watching clouds pass through a sky. Um, and you use the, the strong stressor of the breath or the cold as your, as your center point. Um, so I guess a, a, any questions up to... Up yeah, to Jason, so if, you, if you want to combine the breathing technique and the cold exposure on a daily regimen would you recommend doing say one of them in the morning one in the evening or could you just back them up kind of like set the workout do the breathing first then the cold oh yeah yeah so so any way you want to do it if you want to piecemeal them cold here breath work here what works really well together is doing the breath work first so you lay down you do your three rounds um and then you get up you know maybe wait a minute or two just so you don't feel dizzy. And then you would get into uh, to your cold exposure. One of the benefits of doing it that way is one, your mindset is primed from doing the breathing. And two, your body's primed from doing the breathing because bringing the oxygen, that CO2 to oxygen ratio difference that you get from doing the hyperventilations actually deactivates certain nerve receptors in your body. I'm not saying it's not gonna be cold, I'm just saying you have a little bit better of a chance. And that, that fact that the, it does decrease or it deactivates certain nerve receptors in your body is it, it's used by people with Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis to get more active hours throughout the day um, where they're not in pain and actually reduce the amount of medication that they take. So if you're looking for a way to do it, <clears throat> breathing first, as soon as you wake up, hop in something cold and then go get your day, but feel free to split it up depending on your schedule. And here I, I, we have, I was talking about your mindset, um, how to watch your environment, your thoughts, your breath, that's the, the mindset you get into. Um, and uh, so I put the, the website below here. This is our website, me and my, my business partner. It's called Ignite Sadhana. Sadhana is just a daily practice that you do. So we're trying to ignite a daily practice for people. We don't care if it's Kundalini, breathing, basket weaving, get in touch with yourself and do something intentionally every day. Um, obviously here we're talking about, you know, Wim Hof method, uh, but we also have breathing videos. If you go to our Wim Hof tab on that website and the events tab uh, will also show you what we have coming up. Um, I know, I, I, mean, I didn't realize I would talk this long, uh, but I did want to take you guys through a little bit of breathing. Um, if you, if you guys would like that, uh, if not, you can just listen to what it sounds like, or, you know, you're free to free to do whatever you'd like to, but if you wanted to try, try it out and see what it, it felt like in your body, I'd say 
turn your computer up if it doesn't move or, or, or bring it down to the, the floor with you and and lay down or, or, or get in a comfortable seat. I'm a computer chair. You can also just lean back in a, in a computer chair.